Hi, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, some of you have already seen me several times today, but I'm Nicole Rickard. I'm Head of Communities for East Suffolk Council, and I also work for a uh, for the two CCGs that cover um, East Suffolk. So we've had a couple of sessions so far today. We had Cormac Russell um, talking about asset-based community development and very thought-provoking and... Um, sort of really engaging in terms of the audience and then we had Kim Ledbetter um, from um, the Joe Cox Foundation, Joe Cox's sister um, and, and she kind of brought it right down from a strategic level to a very local level in terms of what they're doing in Batley and Spen in West Yorkshire and some of the work that's going on with the Joe Cox Foundation. But one of the things we wanted to do today was to focus in on East Suffolk because this is part of the East Suffolk Community Partnerships Programme. And um, so we wanted to make sure that there was some East Suffolk content in there. So, so in a bit, I'm going to try and, um, and play the video that we've had um, produced. Now, there is a bit of a health warning attached to the video. Um, for those of you that joined early, I was saying that um, I only got the final version through at 11 o'clock this morning. So uh, it is literally hot off. It's not a hot, hot, hot off the press, I suppose, if it's a video, but it is whatever the, the, the version of that is. So it's, um, and, and it is, they've, what they've, what the film company Bruiser have done is that they've produced a sort of short, concise video and we are having longer individual films develop, but they just can do that in time term, time for today so if any of you who were filmed last Monday or Tuesday are disappointed about the amount of screen time you've got then um, we will be having separate films produced for each project which we will um, will will we'll have more content in them um, and they've just cut them together to, to 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 make a short film for us today so um, so but I hope I hope you're not dis disappointed by it um, when, when I show it but I just want to do I'm going to just share my screen and um, and I just wanted to um, provide a little bit of bit, bit of context for you all in terms of um, what's happening um, in, in, East, in East Suffolk so um, I'm not sharing my emails with you um, although I could do with some help with those um, so hopefully everybody can can see that now. So I'm just going to provide a, a, a little bit of introduction. I'm going to go through these quite quickly because um, I think the film speaks for itself um, and is much more powerful than anything I could say, but just in terms of some, some context. So um, in terms of um, this morning, we, we sort of, we, we, we started off quite strategic and we've heard about projects in, in America and in West Yorkshire. And as I say, we wanted to focus back on East Suffolk. And as many of you know, and, and some of you will already more than be aware of all of this, but some of you might be newer to the area. So I thought it was worth just a quick recap. So the new East Suffolk Council was formed in April, 2019. And it's the largest district council in England, serving almost um, a quarter of a million population. And it covers quite a stretch of the East Coast from Lowestoft um, down, down to um, Felixstowe. Um, so, and it's a relatively affluent area, or so people think, but there are multiple pockets of deprivation and hidden needs and issues around aspiration in young people, um, low pay and seasonal work. And the new council set up eight community partnerships to retain and strengthen its connections with both communities and with partners that are working with those communities. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, we, we've got, um, we, we have got a, a um, plan of the community partnership areas. So um, we've divided the East Suffolk area into eight and you can see the different colours associated with the, uh, those eight community partnerships. And each of those community partnerships has got its own nature and character. The community partnerships were launched with a data-led workshop in each of the eight areas and the data packs were produced by Suffolk County Council. And um, and, and they provided a whole wealth of information about the area that was being considered. And we also had an East Suffolk pack that the Community Partnership Board looked at. Um, but it was important that we focused on the data, but also the insight and priorities from, um, from local groups and, um, and individuals. So it was, it was a combination of data and insight. And I think the reason I'm talking to you about all of this today is that I think one of the things that, that, that 
that struck me I've always been I've always thought loneliness and isolation are hugely important issues and the data packs that we've produced covered a whole wide range of issues economic health and well-being um, you know it's it talks about things like looked after children it talks about environmental challenges um, and I think um, and, and I think some of the issues that we raised really resonated with people and, um, and, and made people that were in the, the workshops curious to find out more. But each of the um, partnerships developed a short list of priorities and then as a group voted to identify their top three. And um, six of the eight community partnerships had isolation and loneliness in their top three priorities. And when the votes across all of the eight community partnerships were added up, social isolation and loneliness was top overall in East Suffolk. And, um, and I think that just shows the strength of um, feeling about isolation and loneliness. The other priority, as you'll see from that table, is um, environmental care and sustainable transport. So, so all sorts of projects around transport and hence the reason why that's the second priority for the community partnerships. But you can see that um, you know the, 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 a lot of the groups were, were concerned about isolation and loneliness and also we've got a couple of groups that were identifying mental health as an issue and obviously there are clear links between the two. So um, and, and all of you will be aware of this but I just thought it was worth flagging up that we do, we, we, we do tend to use loneliness and isolation interchangeably um, and this was just a, what I thought was quite a useful definition, um, which, which kind of explains the, the, the two. So loneliness is about the gap between a person's desired and actual levels of social contact. So it's about the quality of relationships. And isolation is more objective in that it's about the number of contacts that people have. So it's quantity and not quality. But I think it's important to remember that people can be isolated or alone and not have many contacts and yet not feel lonely and equally people can be surrounded by other people have lots of contacts and still still feel lonely and the map on the left hand side of this slide just um, it, it highlights some some work that's based on the census and so the, the the darkest blue areas are where areas are in the highest social isolation quintile so so the highest 20 percent in terms of isolation and I think if you look at that map, what you, what you can see is that there's a real spread between rural and urban areas, between the areas that are identified as being um, potentially uh, where people are, could, could potentially be most isolated. And um, we did a piece of work. There was a, a, a sub, subgroup of what was then the Suffolk Partnership that was set up, that was formed to look at hidden needs, um, working on, on the basis of the Suffolk Community Foundation Hidden Needs Report. And we start, what we started doing was layering um, information about people in East Suffolk. So um, this is just one of the maps, and I've deliberately chosen this because there's, there's quite a lot going on. So it was data from a number of different sources, but this map shows hotspots in terms of um, isolation in people who are over 65 who are caring for somebody else on low income, have no access to a car or van and have a limiting long term illness themselves. And you can see from this that you can actually the, the red, the red areas of the hotspots, you can actually really pick out um, some some target areas. And I think that's one of the things we've been trying to do much more is use information that we've got available. Um, and we certainly use that mapping to, um, to target the Hidden Needs Grants programme. So this was launched under the Suffolk Partnership um, and was a real a new way of allocating grants because quite a lot of the time we, we launch a grant scheme as a council or a council working with partners and we work a lot with voluntary sector partners like Community Action Suffolk and the Suffolk Community Foundation. Um, and push information out. But the, the thing that was different about the Hidden Needs Grants programme was that before a project could apply, they needed to talk to a community support officer, either from the community's team or from Community Action Suffolk or from one of the other partner or from Suffolk County Council or from one of the other partner organisations that we were working with. So the first round, which was 2019, supported eight projects. But I wanted to focus on... Um, the, the 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 sort of phase two if you like um because because these are the these are projects that have just been funded this this year 
Um, and you can see there's a range of, of projects there, and we've got a range of partners that are, that are, that are on the panel. Um, so Suffolk County Council are on the panel and Community Action Suffolk. Um, so it's a sort of, it's a partnership decision, decision making process. But the strength of that is that each of those projects has talked to one of the offices and has, has sort of, we, we, we've had that match between project idea and, um, and knowledge about, you know, how it fits with the, the, with, with, with the priorities and, um, and how to shape those projects and, and, and make them as strong as possible. And I'm really excited about some of the projects on the list and you will hear um, more about some of those when we, when we watch the video. I wanted to touch on COVID and loneliness and the response is obviously um, very relevant today because the Home But Not Alone um, service has been stood back up as of nine o'clock this morning because although people aren't being put back into shielding, they are being advised not to go out to shops and therefore some of our population will, will need support. Um, and although the main purpose for Home But Not Alone initially was to help to connect people to food and medicines, um, we quickly realised that we were getting more and more calls because people were lonely. And we often found out that people were ringing the helpline and didn't really have a need. They just wanted somebody to talk to. And um, so we have developed two key sources of support in conjunction with a whole range of other partners, um, befriending calls and, um, and our grandpads. Um, and we found that um, lot, I mean, lots of our local response groups, so lots of the community response groups were part, pr providing befriending calls, but we'd got a big gap in, in Lowestoft. And, um, and we filled that by setting up a befriending service in Lowestoft with councillors, staff and volunteers to provide weekly calls for more than 150 people. And, and part of the reason for mentioning that is that the community partnership that covers the Lowestoft and Northern Parishes area have allocated them some funding for this Voice of a Friend service so that we've transitioned it to Citizens Advice North East Suffolk. Um, in, 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 the, um, in, in the interim. So we, that's now moved over to sit with them, which I think probably fits very well because they're our social prescribing provider for that lower stuffed area. And the grandpads, some of you will have heard about those. Um, they're simplified technology, so simplified tablets for those who haven't got um, a tablet or a laptop or a computer or access to Wi-Fi. Um, and who might be at risk of digital exclusion and we've secured um, funding for 50 grand pads initially and we've just secured funding for 50 more um, and thank you to Ipswich and East Suffolk CCG who've contributed towards those in that CCG area. So um, I think and I think there's, there's a couple of our grand pad recipients on the first day that, that they received them and um, there's been a huge amount of interest in the grand pads. I think they, um, I got accused of being um, a salesperson for TechSilver, the company that produces them. But we have explored other technology and we do think that the grand pads are, are, are pretty special, um, not least because they've got a 24-7 help button. So if people get stuck or lost, which they shouldn't do because they're actually really easy to navigate. Um, they, they, they can find their way through with help from, from the advisor who, who they'll be able to connect to by just put, push, pushing a button on their grand pad. And I think one of the positives you can see on the right hand picture, the um, cradle. Um, so, so people don't have to um, fiddle around with tiny wires. They just literally have to stand their grand pad on top of the cradle. So I think they've thought about lots of the things that um, the target audience are likely to need or likely to need simplified. And just, just finally, just, just before I, um, I, I, I be quiet and um, get on with playing the video, uh, there's a huge range, uh, range of stuff happening in East Suffolk, some really, really great projects that are happening in East Suffolk and also across the rest of Suffolk. Um, and I've just listed some of those out there. Um, I think there's some projects that have obviously had to adapt because of COVID and we're working with those to try and support them. Um, one of the things that we've done through the Community Partnership Board, they allocated £100,000 worth of funding for a bounce back fund, um, which is aimed 
at exclusively at voluntary and community sector organisations, but particularly um, at places like village halls and community centres, youth groups who have been struggling to open back up. Obviously, there's, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to put some of that on hold. But what we are what saying to groups is apply to the bounce back fund and we'll, you know, we'll help you um, with, with some funding to get back started as soon as it's possible for you to do so. Um, and I think that's a real opportunity. And we've had an amazing response to that funding. And again, that's a partnership um, fund. And we have got Community Action Suffolk and the Suffolk Community Foundation sitting on the panel and looking at the projects. So you'll hear about some of these projects as we go through. Um, but I just wanted to kind of list out that this, there's so much happening and so much happening in local communities. Um, some of you will spot or will have spotted that on the um, first slide around hidden needs grants, I'd mentioned the Age UK Chimwags and I've listed Chimwag groups there. We are working with funding partners to try and find a way to um, support both the groups that were um, already going. So, for example, the Kesgrove and Martlesham area community partnership has put some funding into keeping the Chimwag group going in that area. We'd also got some that were just about to start in other communities that have been identified as priorities, and we are looking at funding to try and ensure that they can continue. So I am going to stop sharing my screen there. Um, has anybody got any immediate questions about that or shall I go on and play the play the film? Anne, question from you. No, it's not a question. I just thought I'd, I'd just like to say that we are working with Joe Reader, ex Age UK, to put together a toolkit for Chinwags. Um, we've got right. some funding to do that. And we're hoping that, that once that's all sorted and costed, there'll be a little bit of funding to get uh, uh, maybe four going, which we would ultimately hand to the community. But the toolkit will be there for good neighbour network groups to. Um, just to take to, to try and run their own. Excellent. So Thank we you. Are, it's on the back burner and we are just trying to keep it alive until such time as they can all start happening again. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Any other hands up? Can't see any. So I think what I'll do is play the video and then give people the um, the opportunity to comment after that. So Okay. My name is Jane Arkley Crouch. I'm the Good Neighbours Network Development Officer for Suffolk and I work at Community Action Suffolk. My name's Anne Osborne and I am the um, Chief Executive Officer of a little charity called the Rural Coffee Caravan. My name's Dave Moore. I am the Chairman of the Rendlesham Good Neighbours Scheme. I'm Maria Norman, I'm Chair of Snape Good Neighbours and Meet Up Monday. I'm also a Parish Councillor because I represent the Good Neighbours on the Parish Council. I'm Chloe Lee, um, Communities Officer for East Suffolk Council um, and I serve the Felixstowe and surrounding villages. My name's Carol Summons and um, I'm a Community Facilitator for um, Citizens Advice. My name's Jeff Stevens. I'm the Director and Founder of Pathways Care Farm. You can tell from the cap I'm a farmer. I'm not really a farmer, but I, I run the charity, yeah. I moved from a city to a very rural village uh, shortly after I'd lost my mum. So I was grieving, I had small children, I was also pregnant, I had my father living with me who had dementia. So actually I've got lived experience of being lonely. I think that's why I'm so passionate about it. I felt incredibly isolated, didn't know where to turn for various different types of help when I first got here. Loneliness is painful. So what we, can, we do what we can. And the Rural Coffee Caravan exists to tackle the causes and symptoms of loneliness and isolation. It's been going for about 17 years now. And we do it in normal circumstances by taking mobile community cafes out across Suffolk to provide a social space in a rural place that's friendly, inviting, very welcoming, um, just so that neighbours can get together. Within Rendlesham, as with all the Good Neighbour Schemes, what we are there 
is to help the people that we live alongside if they've got any problems. Uh, the sort of little mantra that we have is uh, if you need a favour but don't know who to ask, it's probably us. I'm a Communities Officer for East Suffolk Council um, and my role is to um, work with community organisations, voluntary groups, to help them, enable them to get to where they want to go to better serve the community. Period poverty, um, in its basic terms, means not being able to access sanitary items. Approximately a year and a half ago, um, we developed the East Suffolk Period Poverty Initiative, but it was actually inspired by um, some students at Felixstowe Academy. They've called it Proud Period, and they put sanitary items in boxes, in select toilets throughout the school, and they had a subtle sticker above the door so that the students knew that that's where they could go to get free sanitary items. We support people with mental ill health, learning difficulties, and also people with dementia. Uh, we've now started working with people with PTSD as well. So uh, a whole range of people from the age of 17 up to the oldest at the moment is about 85. So it's quite a, quite a spectrum. The district councillors um, put some money so that we could develop this across the district. Um, it was a total of just over 18,000. Um, and with that, with that funding, we were able to purchase boxes, different types of sanitary items, um, and give them to community central organisations to hold. So village halls, CAFs, you know, anywhere that is central to that, that community. Seeing something from start to finish like that, yeah, gives me a, a great deal of satisfaction. I grew up in a small community in Suffolk and um, there can be people that can be less heard from, a um, little bit more isolated, they may not have friends and family locally anymore and the communities can change around them, particularly as they get older. In, in Snape everybody has a telephone number on a fridge magnet um, and if they need any help they ring that telephone number and one of my uh, volunteers on the rotor will pick up the phone and, and uh, answer the question and then allocate somebody else to do their job. That still happens, that's no different from when it was uh, pre-Covid or, or you know, now. Everything stopped on the 23rd of March. Very quickly we sent out a model for a telephone tree to all our communities to get them at least being able to keep in touch by phone. So we moved to our website, turned it into um, a, a resource page of inspirational ideas to stay socially connected while physically distanced. And then we went out and went around the villages. Obviously we couldn't visit but we let people know that we were there and we gave out flowers, bouquets of flowers, we left flowers on people's doorsteps. We just tried to concentrate on being positive and, and uplifting and making people feel remembered, you know, not forgotten. It's just a way of really helping to connect the community, connect the residents within that, um, building on that neighbourly spirit, but just making sure that nobody is left without somebody to call if they just need a bit of support or a chat. I had feedback for the flowers that just made me cry, but I mean, I cry quite easily, but it was just heartwarming. There were people saying that, you know, you've no idea what this meant to me, it's been a really difficult day, I've just heard about so and so or this has just happened or I haven't been out for weeks, I can't even go to the shops, these have just made such a difference um, and just thank you for remembering or thank you for caring. So. Across the four cafes that we operate, the first thing that we wanted to do was to open as soon as we can in accordance with government restrictions but to rebuild confidence in the people that would come into our cafes so that they could see that it was a safe place to come, that we were taking the situation seriously. But fundamentally, we weren't ignoring the need of communities to continue to meet. We were just very sensible in making sure that we'd reduced our capacity to something that we could not just cope with, but be certain that we were safe with. We wanted to make sure that we put common sense and safety in front of profit and experience and money. I recognised after 10 years of working here that there was a big gap uh, in supporting and looking after patients whose health is deteriorating and becoming uh, end of life. You learn everything about them in what can be a relatively short space of time. So whereas you would build up a rapport and build up, you know, getting to know someone maybe over two or three or four years to become f friends, it's super intense and, and there's no fear because, you know, they know that they're passing on. Um, so nothing is off limits, they can f actually physically talk to you about anything at all. Reaching out into communities and working with communities at a local level 
to make a difference um, around end of life care um, is really, really vital. And the work that uh, East Suffolk Council are doing already uh, through their community partnerships will provide a vital link uh, to projects like Compassionate Communities and, and St Elizabeth Hospice um, to, and helping us to reach out and, and make that difference. The voice of a friend um, was something that came from the um, initiative of Home But Not Alone service. Um, and while they were out helping people the most vulnerable, um, they found that there was a lot of people just needed someone to talk to. You know, we had tears on the phone from people who said this is just a, a lifeline for them. You know, you're talking about some individuals who've got no one. We, we've got individuals who maybe have got a partner with Alzheimer's, which is really, really difficult for them, you know, at the best of times, not, not least through, through COVID. It's been a passion of mine, I have to be fair, because I do feel that is needed. It's a service that is needed for everybody and this is the first one that hasn't been for older people only. Just to offer that, you know, as the name suggests, a voice of a friend, that's exactly what it is. And, um, you know, they've built up really good relationships and I'd spoken to most, if not all, of the people who we then ended up, you know, on the scheme of voice of a friend and they are so thankful, you know, it's like, I can't tell you, a really heartwarming. Meetup Mondays um, was started at the same time as we started Snape Good Neighbours, which has been going 18 months. Um, it's very, very important to me to be able to get the people who are isolated in the village out. Obviously, during lockdown, I have been unable to do that. So what I decided was that the people who would regularly come were going to be phone called or met every Monday morning. So now on a Monday morning, if the weather's nice, I and a couple of my uh, committee members will go and knock on their doors to make sure they're all right. Um, and when the weather's bad, we just ring them. So there is that contact the whole time. The good neighbours um, during COVID have been really important because we've collected over 200 prescriptions from the doctors and also shopping, of course. Some of the younger people in the village who had never been involved in volunteering before suddenly contacted us and said, we'll volunteer, we'll help. And uh, so we had about 40 volunteers who were willing to do shopping for people. It was really a, a real help. It's the silver lining of COVID. The positive out of this is that's brought communities together and people want to volunteer and people want to help each other. So that's a really fantastic feeling to have in a community that it, the community exists. We do it because you do, you know, it's because that's what you do. You help your neighbours. If your next door neighbour, you know, was struggling to lift something out of the boot of their car, you'd go and give them a hand. That's the, the way we regard the Good Neighbour Scheme. I don't believe that you need any motivation uh, to do things that are, are good. I have the time, but it's not just one person. It's not me. I've got trustees. I've got four trustees. I've got 40 volunteers. Um, and I've got the local businesses that all support us both financially and also uh, support us you know, with, uh, with product and, 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 and support. You know, as a district councillor, it's really important that East Suffolk uh, feeds back into uh, these organisations because the point of community work is looking for those that need help the most and are vulnerable. So by networking through the Good Neighbours Scheme and Meet Up Mondays, we can find out where help is needed and get those people help, which is so important. I could be sitting at home as a 83 year old, just, uh, just being miserable, couldn't I? To be part of something gives me a purpose in life. I do it because I want to help other people, but it helps you at the same time. I know that it is a cliche to say it, but it really is about helping the community that you live in. And yeah, I'm, I'm just so pleased to have been part of that, you know, th these people, local people's journey. I care about it. Right, so that's that's the um, that's the video. Hopefully, those of you that were featured were pleased with the, um, the 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 almost final version. I think we've still got a bit of tidying up to do. For those of you that could hear the um, talking in the background, that was um, that was the meetup Monday that was happening at the pub we were at when we were doing the filming. So, um, and I think it's quite nice as that there's that noise and hubbub in the background. Um, and a big thank you to the pub that 
um, host hosted us out at Hoseley, the, the 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 dog and shepherd. So that was that was that was really good. So um, I just welcome any feedback or thoughts. I think for me, um, one of the things I particularly wanted to pick up today was. Um, whether there's any gaps in terms of what we're doing as East Suffolk, whether there are other things that we could be doing through that social isolation and loneliness theme of the community partnerships. But I just welcome any thoughts and feedback. And um, as I say, we will be um, asking Bruiser to do some editing of individual films. So we've got some individual standalone project films because as those of you that were filmed will know, that's a very short amount of content for what was about 20, 25 minutes filming for most of you. So there is a lot more content that we want to do and we are going to work with them to, to get that. So you will be able to have an individual film of your project. But yeah, I'd welcome your thoughts and feedback about what's happening already, but also whether there are additional things we could do in the future. Does anybody want to kick off? Anne, do you I want just to want to say how uplifting that was. You know, we're faced all the time, aren't we, with, with so much sadness and negativity and challenges. But this is who we are. This, this, is, this is who we are. And we just need to be more us. So thank Absolutely. you for putting that together. No, no problem. I was really pleased with it. Like I say, it's been quite close to the wire, being really honest with you all, not getting a film that you're meant to be showing until 11 o'clock on the morning you're meant to be showing it when you're hosting another session was slightly hair raising, but <laughs> but hey, um, Steve. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to say I, I turned off a Minister of State so I could watch that. So uh, <laughs> and, and I think I think what I watched was far more interesting um, and far more uplifting than the, what the Minister of State was saying, that's for sure. So, um, I, I mean, I just think it's uh, it, it is heartening. You know, the, the, the two sessions we've had already um, have very much focused, and certainly um, the, the one first thing this morning has focused on the, on the bigger picture nationally about what the issues are and what's going on and what the, what the challenges are nationally. But I think it's really important that, you know, that we... That we celebrate the success that is happening right across East Suffolk um, you know uh, and wider I'll, I'll include a bit of the rest of Suffolk but but right across East Suffolk all the really positive stuff that is happening there and you know I think there's an opportunity for uh, for us if we can share that film as widely as possible because people will look at it and they'll go well we could do that we could do that in our village or in our um, area or in our neighborhood and you know, or, you know, even with in, in our bit of the town, um, you know, we can scale it down, we can make it larger, we can do all that. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from the, from the stuff that's going on, and a lot of opportunities to share that across the, uh, across the piece, really, so that we can all look at stuff and think, God, oh, you know, it's not, we could do that, we're almost there. And this, you know, by speaking to these people that are already running it, we can we can pick their brains. We can understand the pitfalls that they've been through in setting up. We can ask them the question, well, what would you do differently? And we can do it differently. Um, and, you know, the reality of that is there's a whole lot of learning for the community in that. So I, I think it's a really useful, really useful video. And uh, and of course, you know, I know that the people that are on this call are already doing that stuff. So I thanks to them as well. I see. I'll shut up. I'll, the minister was dull believe me <laughs> excellent thank you um james yeah hi thank you um look i just want to echo what steve was saying i think there is a, a, a secret network almost where people learn from each other and i know helen lewis who's on the call today she spends a lot of time who's involved with the good neighbors meet up monday in hosley she spends a lot of time talking to other people and in fact that communication is probably far better than something coming from a council that tells you how to do something but by learning from each other i think is really key and we look at other communities and go hey that would work in our community and i know other people look at us so that network is really important. That is something that's really strong in East Suffer, and we should be proud of that network in particular. So hats off to all of you who do that sort of networking and the keep the communication going. It's really important. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Graham, Councillor Newman. 
Yeah, I just wondered whether um, people thought this is working better in rural areas than it does in, in town areas. I mean, OK, I'm in Felixstowe, but I'm also the Lowestoffs and, the, you know, the, the, the Albras, the Southwolds of this world. Um, do these kind of schemes work better in rural areas where there's more of a sort of community feeling than they do in towns? Um, Jane, do you want to take that? Um, Jane's the Good Neighbour Coordinator for Suffolk, who obviously featured on the on the video. And so, if I let if I let Jane and Anne, Anne respond, because they can probably respond directly to your question, Graham. Yeah, oh, thank you, and thank you for um, letting us be involved in the video. It was it was really such a lovely thing to be able to, um, you know, for Maria and Dave, and for James and Helen, um, to be able to really share what they do and I think um this morning in, in Cormac's session um the group that I was placed in we did have a bit of a conversation around um the things that often stop people from um from from starting their community activity is fear it's fear that they haven't got enough to give or they haven't got enough time or uh, they're worried that they won't be able to do things properly it you know it, it won't be a sort of um it won't be accepted by the rest of the community or it'll be difficult to get people involved um and I think to tie into sort of Graham your question historically um the good neighbors schemes um good neighbors groups in our network have historically tended to be within rural areas um or within uh, relatively small sort of parishes um, even in, uh, you know, we've got we've got them in Albra, um, and uh, and sort of some some slightly larger sort of um, communities, but uh, still they weren't historically town based. We've got a really successful, busy one in Wickham Market as well. Um, what we've found with COVID um, is that uh, because of the necessity and people realising that, you know if we don't do something to help our neighbours, who will? If we don't connect with the people down the road that we know that we see every so often that, and they need help, who will? Um, people found this, you know, they rallied, they did what people do in, um, uh, in unprecedented times, you know, they pull together and they look out for each other. Um, and um, I know Tracy this afternoon, who's doing the Eden Project session, um, she often refers to the permission of snow, where, in, you know, if, if it's a, if it's snowy, you get snowed in. You will ask your neighbour if they need some help, if they need a pint of milk, if they can't get out because maybe they, you know, can't get to the shops or you know whatever. So people found that actually, well, we can do, we have to do, so we will, um, and that's what we've seen with the amazing community response across Suffolk is that people have found the courage, they've found the community spirit. They've, they've figured out, actually, we just have to do something and see where it goes. Um, what that's meant um, with the Good Neighbours activity is that actually now um, it's taken away some of the fear because they've been able to do it. They've done it. They haven't, you know, they, they, they did stuff as they had to without worrying about, um, you know, do I have to have lots of governance? Do I have to have DBSs? They just did in the first instance because it was an emergency response. Um, and in doing that, they've then gone, okay, well, if we want to keep this going in the long term, how do we keep that going? What do we need to do to make it a bit safe and sustainable? How do we keep momentum? How do we keep people on board? Um, and actually, how can we harness this goodwill and this spirit that's come about and leave a positive legacy? Um, and that's where, I mean, particularly with Ipswich, for example, we didn't have any good neighbours schemes or um, sort of uh, community support groups with a phone number, which were made up of residents volunteering to help each other um, within the community and, and to be there come what may. And now we've got four groups that are either have become good neighbours schemes or like Ipswich Community Support, where they're covering such a large area and they're developing their own sort of groove of what they're doing. Um, but they've joined the network of, of the Suffolk Good Neighbour Network so um, so that they can sort of share what's going on with themselves and like within in, in the town group, particularly within Ipswich, I think what they've found is that there's real strength in being those hyper local groups 
that know their immediate communities particularly and they want to build on that community relationship going forward so um but they also know that where they overlap and where they meet up um, those Ipswich groups are talking with each other and we're having meetings and we're facilitating conversations as to, well, how do we work together alongside each other, support each other and make sure nobody falls between the cracks and people have choice? And, you know, what do you, you know, what they want to do going forward? How can we best support that as a group together? So mm -hmm. I think, whereas traditionally a lot of the schemes and groups um, within our network were parish based and they were within rural communities very often, Actually, now we're seeing that people in towns um, have felt that they could be galvanised with their neighbours more. They could connect with other people that were like minded, that wanted to make a difference. And they're starting, they, they've sort of overcome that fear or the potential unknown of that, where you right. don't necessarily have those traditional community connections. So, 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 you know, um, so sort of strongly. So there, there's you. change. <laughs> Sorry, Thank that was you. a lot of that's great thank you really useful and do you want to comment on the rural more urban issue yeah no i i just wanted to um say about the meetup mondays i mean two of our most successful uh meetup mondays are actually uh, one's in ipswich and the other one is in Lowestoft. um and they both had in in normal times um sort of 30 plus people attending each week and I think what Jane says about people being afraid is is very true but the feedback that we've um, received seems to show that a meetup Monday vibe is a completely different thing and people are are aware that they are the guest of the publican it's an invitation that's come from the publican or, or the cafe owner um, and that gives them the courage to go in and those groups are frankly amazing. I mean, we, we've got we've got people who've joined pub quizzes and and done all sorts of things they never dreamed they would do. People who haven't been out for six months, only to the shops, say, are, are joining in social activities where they felt, like Jane said, too shy to to go to any community events. So, Graham, I would say if you think you've got any pubs in Felixstowe that might be community minded enough to host this. It can be a real sort of springboard for all sorts of other community activity. They are quite remarkable things. They honestly are. And James will tell you about the shepherd and dog one, um, which is a rural one, but the town ones are excellent as well. Thanks very much for that. That's very right. Thank you. As well, of course, we should work on it. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Um, I was just going to pick up a, a, a question or a point in the chat from Susan Stewart, um, uh, which was about including young people more who are also isolated because they don't drive, are often stuck because transport is poor. Um, and um, just a bit of a trailer, we have got a focus on transport um, because, as I say, that's the second community partnership priority. The, the tomorrow's sessions are focusing on transport. Um, and Susan goes on to say, I was heartened that one scheme included young people in combating isolation in the elderly, but they feel missing in this discussion. Um, one, one quick thing I wanted to st say before I open open this up is that um, we we did we have got an initiative called Youth Voice, which is um, run by the council and was um, a, a physical suggestion box in um, schools. We have moved that online from this term for obvious reasons, because we can't go in and out of schools collecting these suggestion boxes. And um, the the information from from those youth voice online comments and suggestions is going to be fed directly into each of the individual community partnerships so there will be a direct young persons feed into the community partnerships because we had identified that as as, as being something that was was missing so hopefully from this term onwards we'll be able to involve the community partnerships in discussing the issues that young people in their area have raised so I'm conscious that Rachel's already got a hand up about something else but has anybody got any specific um, comments or thoughts about Susan's point? About young people and isolation. Anybody want to come back on that? I mean, it's it, it's certainly something that is raised um, and has been raised a number of times by our Waverley Youth Council, um, and something that, that that they have fed in, and particularly the impact on uh, mental ill health and and. We know that young people are one of the groups that is most affected. 
Rachel, do you want to come on this one? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, yeah, it, it is a real issue. Um, and I know we are one of the oldest parts of the country, as it were, but we do have young people, and especially with the, the flux being caused by lockdowns, at the, you know, past and present, um, they are sort of with us more, perhaps, however, however for however long. Um, and, you know, yes, it would be nice. It would be nice to think that they will stick around, um, but they have to have something to stick around for. Uh, and it, I don't, this is a bit random, so just bear with me, but I know we're consulting at the moment as a council on cycling, uh, making cycling more attractive and easier, not just for, you know, people for two weeks in the summer with their families, um, but actual proper what I call proper as a cyclist myself, commuting cycling as well as for pleasure and leisure. Um, and I, I, it's not, it's not, there is no one silver bullet. I'm not suggesting that it is at all, but it, it, it makes me think of it in relation to young people, particularly who don't drive, um, because apart from the age barrier, it's very expensive to learn to drive, let alone get a car and insurance and all the rest of it. So it seems to me that there, there is perhaps a joined up thinking opportunity here to make cycling much easier and more attractive and I've said before and it's not just me I'm sure that about electric charging points for bikes we always talk about them in relation to cars but actually it would be it's important to have them for bike charging as well and at, at our council offices is the obvious um, example I would say of that potentially um, so I'm just thinking for young people so that they can get around which is so essential for, for all manner of reasons, that could be something that could help them. Um, I know it can't be done tomorrow, but it's something that I think we need to really think about and plough some Great. maybe thought and resources into. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, and I, I think it's something we can certainly feed back into the Community Partnership Board as being one of the potential priorities around isolation and loneliness. Um, Peter, do you want to come in? Yes, very briefly, and apologises for, for lack of my image, but you wouldn't want to see me. Um, the thing about isolation in terms of young people, and you touched on it just now, Nicole, by talking about the Youth Council. I mean, I've got two teenage children. Uh, my daughter spends a great deal of time on her device. I mean, I'll go in there at, you know, half past 12 at night, and she's got two computers going, talking to several different people. Now, um, how much interaction has been trying to be made um, with the the online community that's out there i don't mean formally but can we find some way of getting young people as ambassadors to be out there and i don't mean spying but generally speaking looking and, and, and taking samples of, of conversations that are going on and things that young people might I mean you know with respect to everybody that i can see on here none of us is young you know, we, we are not of that age group where we are interacting all the time. You know, the speed of my daughter's thumbs when she's writing to me, for instance, I, I can't understand it. Uh, my son's the same. He's now started driving so he can go out, but he can't now, you know, and he then gets onto his device. So interacting with kids who are outside the formal bubble of, of groups that we speak to, how can we get out there to them? That You know, the hundreds, thousands of kids who are out there using the Internet all the time, but without being seen to be like, uh, you know, the well-meaning uncle or aunt trying to, to look after them. It, it can be very difficult. It can seem awfully patronising. I just really don't know the answer, but I can use my kids any way you like. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think one of the things we're keen to do is, is to ask youth voice questions um, like that and, and get views of young people because obviously they they can advise best about how we can how we can work with young people and engage them in what we're doing um, and I know Anne's put a comment in the chat bar about our community in Fram running some um, new projects for for young people so brilliant thank you any other comments or questions I think that was everybody that had got their hand up. Apologies if I've missed every, anybody, but I think that was that was it. Rachel, do you want to come back? Yeah, I was sorry. Uh, in relation to me originally having my hand up, it was about something else. I just wanted to just sort of flag up, and I don't wish to sound negative at all because what the film we've seen is is fantastic. What people are up to, it's lovely to see, um, and there's been some amazing work for sure. 
um, with I mean, I've been blown away by a lot of these organisations. I didn't even know what they were fully doing. So that's wonderful. All I would, I just a sort of cautionary note, maybe that what concerns me slightly um, is at the moment with COVID, with lockdowns, you know, people have and are rallying. But there was, there's just two slight points I'd like to make. One that thing that concerns me is when life does go back to some sort of normal, and I know we've got no idea what that's going to be right now or when or whatever, but it, at some point things will change. Um, you know, if and when, and I, I, I kind of, I have like probably a lot of people have, I'm having a love-hate relationship with this or this COVID thing, because on the one hand, it has reunif reunified communities just by sheer dint of the fact that people are more static than they, than they have been for a very long time. Um, but the, the bad thing, the bad things are the bad things, and I don't need to go into what we all know what they are. But what worries me slightly is if we have to go back to some sort of normal, and this is eventually as over as it's likely to be, that people will then take off, perhaps literally in some cases, start travelling again, commuting again, whatever, and those people that have been so fantastically picked up, regarded and looked after and connected will become once more forgotten. So I just did a plea really, you know, that, that we just stay a bit mindful of that and, and, and not just abandon people once, you know, we all go, we all go back to jobs, whatever, life. Um, and the other thing is just to sort of be, be, look after yourselves and each other as well, because quite often as we know, I used to be a carer, so I've seen this happen a lot. The carers become in need of the care so it's really it's really important that pe that we do rally and we but we look out for each other, the people that you think are fine and doing the caring for their neighbours, friends, what family, whatever, they need help and support too. And all too often they can burn out. So I think it's important that we look out for it for, for the carers in in the most informal sense. I don't mean necessarily mm. carers or family carers. So that was no. it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think that's a really important point that we need to make sure that people don't get left behind again as 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 things return to something more like normality. Um, and I and I think it's really important that some of the projects that have been sort of kicked off with funding through the hidden needs grants and the um, and potentially the bounce back funding as well. One of the things we always look at is sustainability and how we can try and make sure that they're not just funded for ten weeks or twelve weeks or you know, six months, however long it is, that, that we actually help the groups to move towards sustainability and being self-sufficient. And I think there's much more of a drive amongst local people to try and do that. So I think we're in a better place probably now than we ever have been before. And I think we need to build on the groundswell of volunteers and try and I think one of the challenges we've got is to try and retain some of that volunteering energy and passion and um, and continue that into into the future. I haven't got any other hands up. So if nobody's got any other thoughts or questions, thank you very much for attending this afternoon. It's I think, been uh, nice. I think Maria's got oh. her hand up. Oh, sorry. It's not it's not a virtual one, it's a wavy one. Ah, waving hands. Sorry, sorry, because I've only got some part of part of screen on show because I've got everything else open. I didn't see that. So Maria. Mute. All, all I was going to say is. I want to try and give all the people in the village, in my village in Snape, um, a sense of looking forward. So what I actually did this morning is I've been round to a lot of my Meetup Monday clients uh, and Good Neighbours clients, and I've given them a, a plant pot that I've planted with seeds um, and a bit of information and telling them how to nurture it and then telling them that in March, I'm going to take them all out and we're going to plant them in the village verges. No. Um, so it's just something I've done. So I'm trying to get them to look forward to something as well as talking about what's happening right now. Absolutely. What a, what a great idea. That's really yeah, it's, lovely. It's been a bit yeah. hard work, but it's, it's, it's been fine. And, and the look on these people's face, faces when I've just said, I'm giving you something to nurture. You've got a responsibility here. And then yes. we're going to go out and we're going to dig it at the, the very verge up and we're going to put some flowers in to brighten everything up. And that's, wow. that went down really well this morning. Yeah, brilliant. No, that's a really lovely idea. I, th I think that's probably a, a, a great note to end on, actually. So thank you, everybody. Much appreciated and um, appreciate you joining in. And we will be circulating the film.